Hi everyone, it's Vanessa. I wanted to kind of make a recommendation slash TBR video that I've been thinking up and planning since all the stuff that occurred in Charlottesville about two weeks ago at this point. It kind of took me a while to finally sit down and record this video, but alas, I am here. I'm going to break this down into recommendations first. The recommendations part is not just going to be about books. I'm also going to include articles, podcasts, and documentaries to contextualize what's happening. If you're at all interested in any of those topics or discussions, I think that these are good sources to educate yourself and to become more aware these are things that after I watched, read, listened to them, I felt a lot more informed that have helped me create my worldview and that have added to the previous education that I got from college studying history and I'm wanting to stay in touch with the lessons and lectures that I was taught in college so I'm kind of supplementing myself by you know, finding these things on the internet. So I'll start with my, my recommendations. The first book that I could recommend to you guys is Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is involved with the Equal Justice Initiative that he started. Brian Stevenson is just in general a great leader in my opinion and someone that when I listen to him I feel a lot more calm. I feel like he is speaking truth to the things that I believe in and he's doing that with his law degree. This Just Mercy book is a book recounting his experiences trying to represent people who don't have the economic means to do so. A lot of this book does focus on the race aspect of it, but he definitely pinpoints more that it's about economic class and that that is impeding people from getting the representation that they need. He focuses a lot on just how punitive the American justice system is in, in a really heart-wrenching way that clearly spells out to you why capital punishment is not the way. We should be a lot more compassionate when it comes to our prison system. The next book that I can recommend to you guys is Ghetto Side by Jill Levy. This book is Jill Levy reporting on a specific case that occurred in South Central Los Angeles where a young man was murdered. It really focuses on that primarily, but it uses a detective in general to kind of show us how important clearance rates are and that when you fail your community in actually bringing people to justice who have killed others, you limit the relationship that you could have with your community. She makes it really approachable to the reader. The same thing with Just Mercy and all the things that I'm recommending, but especially Ghetto Side, you feel for all sides. So you feel the difficulties that police go through to, to try to solve cases and how difficult it is for them to get people to speak to them, but you also hear and feel for the families of victims and just in general for underrepresented and impoverished people. The next book that I recommend, I could recommend I guess two of them, it is just an author, Timothy B. Tyson. He is a historian and his first book that I read was Blood Done Sign My Name and it is mostly a memoir but it also is a history of a crime, a lynching that occurred in his town when he was growing up and kind of him trying to discover more about it because it was a lynching that kind of was swept under the rug. All of the paperwork that could tie the things that occurred during that time are kind of lost and it's him trying to find all of these hidden papers and him looking back at it and, and realizing how ludicrous that is that you know people weren't brought to justice for lynching this man. I could also mention The Blood of Emmett Till, which is his most recent work. I've mentioned it on my channel before about some trepidation that I felt after I was done reading it and doing more research about it. If you're someone who has never read anything really about Emmett Till, I think this gives a full picture of all of that and that includes, you know, the family that was involved and how black media and black newspapers covered it. It covers a lot. Mamie, who is Emmett's mom, it obviously also covers the fact that all of this was unfounded and based on a lie, as seen by the interview he conducted with the person who accused Emmett Till of whistling at her. I felt like I really learned a lot 
reading it, um, but I also always want to mention anything that gave me some hesitancy. The next book that I will mention is On Tyranny by Timothy D. Snyder, and this will be the last one that I'll mention. On Tyranny is a practical guide of ways that you can look at the world that we are living in today and consider how these things are tarnishing our democracy. Things that you have to watch out for of people in power. And he kind of just gives you 20 lessons based on his past research and study. He is a historian as well. I thought this one was really well done in the way that it showed examples and also just in the very short manner that it was told. So it's a very tiny book but I think that it really packed the punch. The lessons that I learned there I still think about today. I'll go next to film recommendations and most of these are documentaries. I think all of them are documentaries actually. The first one that I wanted to mention was Ken Burns' Central Park 5 documentary that he did for PBS. Ken Burns is just an amazing filmmaker, and in this one he focuses on the falsely accused Central Park 5, who were found guilty and sentenced for the murder of a jogger, kind of like the media storm that occurred afterward. The general public really believed that these young men, who were all black and brown, killed this woman because they were like a pack of people just inciting violence in Central Park. They were all very young, like 14 to 17 I want to say, how the police intimidated them into false confessions and they were in prison for a really long time before they were exonerated because their DNA did not match the DNA that was found on the crime scene. Donald Trump himself put out a whole ad in a newspaper accusing these men and saying we need to bring back capital punishment in New York State and they need to be held accountable for what they did when they didn't do anything. I thought this was really important viewing right before the election and I also think it's important because Ava DuVernay is coming out with a new series on Netflix, documentary series, focusing on the Central Park Five. I think it's going to be great because this PBS documentary was short and this Netflix documentary series is going to allow for a lot more of discussion. I feel like everything that she does is important. And that leads me to my next recommendation, which is her documentary film on Netflix, 13th, which I watched recently, even though it's been out for a while. I feel like the majority of what she discussed are not things that are new to me, but I think the way she approached so many deep ingrained issues and vast issues into one documentary was really masterful. She had a lot of people that I, I really admire, like Henry Louis Gates Jr., Jelani Cobb, a lot of scholars that I really admire their work. I would also recommend The Black Power Mixtape, which is a documentary that's kind of different because it was done by Swedish filmmakers, so it's kind of like they're outsiders coming into this society that we have here. I think it gives a, a new dimension to it because they are not participating. I watched it a really long time ago, so I don't remember the majority of it, but what what I do remember of it is that it has a really great interview with Angela Davis who I was doing a paper on during college and I watched it for that reason. She is so eloquent and able to get across her points, you know, why she needs black power. The next thing I would recommend is Gideon's Army, which is another documentary. This one is by HBO, I believe, and it focuses on three different public defenders in the South. It focuses on their different paths. They all view it very differently. One of them is acting nervous about the potential of getting these fingerprints done. You know, him as a public defender doesn't have the money to get any of those tests done, so he acts really nervous about it, which makes the prosecution, who also doesn't have really the money to do this actually run the test on these prints which help his clients. There's another really interesting person that they featured on here. I think her name is Brandy. She is trying to get one specific boy off of something that she really feels he didn't do, that he is innocent. She really explains to us how this could honestly change his life, like break him down. It would stop his education, it would stop his ability to get a job, and it would just alter the course of his life. She also meets Congressman John Lewis in this and she regards him as her hero. To me it really showed how public defenders are the civil rights activists and organizers of our day. The way that we had Congressman John Lewis in the, in the 50s and 60s, we have these public defenders doing the work on the ground. I'll quickly mention the coverage that Vice did during Charlottesville. If you haven't watched it, it's about 20 minutes long. They got access to one of 
the white supremacist groups and people that were involved and they really lay out their ideas to us without any fear and without any reluctance they are just clear about it it was really eye-opening to hear them say the words and sentences that they said it makes me more flabbergasted considering what they were saying about like Ivanka Trump in it and her marrying Jared Kushner and that our president did not take a harder stance for people who are saying these things about even his daughter. And last but not least, Finding Your Roots. Finding Your Roots is a genealogy series on PBS and the majority of the people that are taking part in Finding Your Roots in one way or another are connected to slavery. The way that they tell these stories, it's very compassionate and intricate and show us how this institution has run so deep into our history. I feel like a lot of people are, are quick to say that, you know, that's past. And I think this shows us just how deep this part of our history runs through, you know, the actual person that you are today. If your family has been here for decades and maybe centuries, there is one way or another you are connected to slavery. And I think we should all just acknowledge that and be more aware of that and study that more carefully instead of believing that we live in this post-racial society. We do not. I will mention two quick articles. The first one is called The White Flight of Derek Black and and it focuses on a young man who was really meant to become like the successor of this white nationalist group. His father was really involved in this and it was kind of just seen as a matter of fact that he was going to succeed his father. But he went to college and he met people who were different than him and he started questioning his beliefs and what he's been taught his whole life. Saw that what he was taught was incorrect and that the, the friends that he made in college really changed his viewpoints and made him question himself. I thought about it as the things were occurring in Charlottesville. I was like, remember the article I read from the Washington Post? I thought it was really interesting and, and particularly because he went to a college in Florida. Florida is, in a lot of places, is a very diverse state and I feel like I've been very, I don't know if blessed is the right word, but I've been around different kinds of groups immigrant groups like my family is a part of and black Americans particularly growing up where I did in South Florida and then particularly working with elementary students in a neighborhood that was primarily black. I really saw the struggles that these children go through and the difficulties that they face that public education should really help alleviate but sometimes it's very difficult when there's not a lot of money to go around. And then the other article that I mentioned is an article by Nicole Hemmer who is a really great historian in my opinion. She does the Past Present podcast. She's from Charlottesville so she has that background where she knows the community that she is in and she really focused on how Typical it is for there to be like a symbol of progressivism in this town that's not necessarily seen as a reality for all. So kind of like we are a very inclusive town, um, but you don't see that actually in the school and the housing and in the ways for people to become more mobile economically. Sometimes I feel like we focus a lot on it, kind of like um, symbols that show us that we are getting better when there are a lot of things that are a lot more difficult to dismantle happening in the background that we don't focus as much on and that's something that I always have to keep in mind too so I'll link all of those down below and I'll quickly mention some podcasts and I'll try to be really limited I feel like this video is going to be really really long but here I am I'll talk first about Call Your Girlfriend, which is a, a really fun podcast for the most part. I feel like the, the women on there are really smart and know the words to say. I really valued in this post Charlottesville podcast that they did, they discussed the wealth gap and the lack of capital and how that is so important to acknowledge. A lot of Americans haven't been able to catch up and I also really liked how they talked about the man who ran over Heather Heyer and a bunch of other people on that street in Charlottesville had a history of domestic violence against his mother and how a lot of these cases of white young men who are committing violence go back to domestic violence in their house and how it's normalized and okayed and how they perpetuate it themselves. I'll mention Slay's Political Gatfest, which is probably my favorite podcast when David Plotz is not being a punk. I really liked in this one John Dickerson, who is the host of Face the Nation, focused on how Donald Trump has really 
talked about violence and how he wishes that people could be violent like they used to be in the good old days. That kind of is ridiculous with his very teleprompt e messages that he was, you know, given by his staff to read out loud to us about how we must unite and not be violent. Emily Bazelon, who's also a host on the podcast, discussed the ACLU and their stance on neo-Nazis and white nationalists and white supremacists and how she feels that probably the ACLU was going to change their stance depending on if these people were armed or not because having a gun on you and having militias that you hired to come to Charlottesville with you to protect you are going to add another component to your march and your rally and your protesting. And lo and behold, like less than a week later, the ACLU came out with this exact same stance. The United States of Anxiety Culture Wars has a really interesting podcast. I haven't listened to it thoroughly, like the whole, all the episodes that they have out, but I listened to one recently about Confederate flags and how, you know, Confederate flags are kind of normal in our society, especially in the South. I say in the South like I live there still, but I don't live there anymore. But when I lived in Florida, it was very common for me to see Confederate flags. When I lived in West Virginia, it was very common for me to see Confederate flags. When I drove anywhere, like literally I saw a Confederate flag that was probably like th the biggest pole you can imagine flying above probably more than 50 feet as I was driving on a boulevard called Martin Luther King Boulevard in Tampa, Florida. So the contrast to that, like yeah, that's for your private land, but Confederate flags are very normal in Florida and in the South where I have driven. One of the podcasts that they focused on was on the prevalence of Confederate flags, specifically in New York State. This is a WNYC podcast, so it's from New York, and they're trying to track the confederate flags that they see in the area and they focused a lot on this podcast on how pop culture really um, made it normal for confederate flags to be used they discussed like sweet home alabama and they discussed like the dukes of hazard to show us how these things that we take in in pop culture kind of allow us to be like yeah confederate flags are normal the last one that i'll talk about is the daily which i feel is a podcast that i've mentioned a lot on my channel michael barbaro has focused a lot on these issues post charlottesville you know discussing white nationalists and discussing white supremacists what happened in charlottesville our president's comments about it but he also discussed one specifically that i wanted to bring up to you guys and that's him interviewing a reporter who embedded himself into a website that was for neo-Nazis and white supremacists and they had actual audio of the conversations that these men were having on these websites and discussing whiteness and discussing like how white you have to be to be white technically and I'm saying like 87 point something percent is you are white. They focused on the ways that these people are congregating online. You know how susceptible other people can be in joining these things. That's gonna be it for a podcast. So I'm currently editing this video and I've come to the realization that it's way too long already and I haven't even gotten to the TBR part of it. So I think I'm going to end it here and I'll just make a new video for the TBR. I hope that you enjoyed watching this even though it was really long. I just had a lot of thoughts and I've been consuming a lot of things regarding this that I wanted to talk about. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in that next video. Bye-bye.